There's some cool stuff today. Finally getting into chapter three. Uh, somebody who watches this on uh, on uh, internet because of this guy bought me markers. Oh, my friends! One of my friends from Escondido was watching this. I actually, and she's like, she noticed that I didn't have markers in the first two, and she's like she bought me some, and I left them in my car. Anyway, if this one doesn't work, I'm gonna send somebody else to get them. And okay, this one's good. I'll save them for a future date. Um, okay, Genesis chapter three. Let's read through. I'm gonna probably get up to verse seven, and then uh, I'll save the rest for next week. If, we, if we're not all dead by then. <laughs> who thinks this is a hoax, the coronavirus thing? And who's like, who thinks it's just the end of the world? I Neither. Know. And who's like, aqal in, in between and just washing your hands? <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. I, I refuse to wash my hands. If you wash your hands, it means you don't trust God. <laughs> it's a joke. It is a joke. Oh, <laughs> it is a joke. So I, people are putting words in my mouth last week in this other... That's why I'm never doing that Bible study again, by the way. Okay. Verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any of the any other wild creature that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Okay. Uh, serpent. Gosh. Let me just close the door. I, I've seen some uh, interpreters argue that this is like an actual animal. Um, but I'm not sure I buy that. Even, even in my sort of symbolic weird reading, it's unusual. What's going on here? What exactly would, would the, the meaning of that be? I think it's pretty clear that there's something supernatural or sort of subnatural about this. It's something demonic. Traditionally, the interpretation is that this is Satan sort of taking the form of a serpent. Or like, I don't know, maybe possessing a serpent. That'd be, that'd be kind of weird too, but whatever. So it seems to me that that traditional reading is, is the right one. That the idea here is that by means of some sort of animal nature the devil is sort of attempting to tempt uh, these, these sort of primordial human beings. But remember my, my sort of basic reading of all of this text here is that this is the story of what always happens. Okay? This is not the story of some past historic event. This is the story of all, let's call it temptation, even though I don't know if we've analyzed it that far yet, but this is the story of all of us at the moments of our temptation, when we are in the midst of making a choice. And so, at the very least, we can kind of initially say, the devil in tempting us makes use of animal things. And now the easiest reading of that is animal instincts, animal desires. Namely, and in fact it goes perfectly with the story, namely, what are the things that we have in common with animals? Well, the need to eat food, and the desire for sex, the desire for sleep, uh, and then consequentially, the things that are sort of human versions of this animal side is money. Because why do we need money in the first place? Well, we need money because we need food and shelter. But in the same way that food can become a temptation that can hurt us if we eat it you know, the wrong, in the wrong way or too much or whatever. Um, thank you. In the same way that food can become a temptation, even though it's sort of nature-based, certainly money can be a temptation. Because at least food has a natural limit. We can eat a certain amount of food and then we stop. Our body just like physically can't take anymore. Okay. Yesterday, no, Sunday, I'm like, okay, it's Sunday. You know. I'm going to go to In-N-Out. I went to In-N-Out. felt like In-N-Out. Go to In-N-Out. And in my mind, I was like, okay, I'm going to get two 
I was hungry. Before you judge me, I'm gonna get two three by threes. Okay? I'm gonna get two three by animal style, that's the way I like them. And so I had in my mind three by threes, and then I like, what comes out of my mouth was, I'm gonna have, I'll, I'll take three three by threes. It's nine patties. So I'm sitting there in and out, and I'm like, I got these three huge, I had, I ate, I ate all of them. <laughs> and it wasn't even at the at that last half of that last burger, it wasn't even gluttony. It was pride. <laughs> you know? I just had to finish it. David knows what I'm talking about, right? Why am I talking about this? I have no idea. Oh, so when we get into the temptations, just look at the, the way Eve's, Eve's looking at this fruit. So it's food based. So my point is this sorry, the snake sort of illustrates, even if it doesn't directly symbolize, but maybe even symbolize it, it illustrates the devil is using animal stuff to get us to make this sort of disobedient choice against God. And the animal stuff represents stuff inside of us, in our bodies, that uh, uh, can be, sort of, that can go too far. Things like food and sex and stuff like that. Okay, So let's jump a little bit, just to kind of establish that point a little bit better. Verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, to a delight to the eyes, it says, right? Delight to the eyes. And three, desire to make one wise. These are these things now, the, 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 the first letter of John and Certainly, very quickly, the patristic, patristic tradition associates this with a kind of three levels of temptation that we human beings are capable of. Okay, um, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life is the way I think Saint Augustine says this. Um, I don't want to spend a ton of time on this, just because a lot of people talk about this all the time. But I do want to get this on the board. Temptation can come in all these different forms. Um, some of them are just plain old bodily things. Some of them are, oh, that's beautiful. It's not that I'm going to eat this or something like that. It's just, wow. I don't know, you see like a nice, uh, I don't know, if someone sees a nice pair of Nikes. And like, okay, he's not, that's not gluttony. That's not a bodily desire. That's this temptation. Of, okay, I want to sort of possess this kind of beautiful thing. Okay. And then pride of life, as in I want to sort of make myself better than others or better than I am intended to be by God. So let me just write out the traditional. So this is lust of the flesh. So all, you know, gluttony and sexual temptations and sleeping too much and all that stuff would, would fit right here. Would alcohol and, go on number yeah, one? Yeah, alcohol would go here. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And this is called lust of the eyes. Is that what I call it? Yeah. Of the eyes. This has to do with possessions and stuff like that. And then this is called the pride of life. Pride. Okay. Just a sort of early categorization of different types of temptations. But I want to go back a little bit. Let's look at how... So again, I repeat for the billionth time, this is the story of what always happens. So what is the structure of your temptations? This is what Genesis is, is telling us. The serpent comes, and it, so that he's cunning. So it's not just animal stuff, it's cleverness that the devil uses. And he says to the woman, did God say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Okay. Let's go back a couple of verses and compare what the, what, what the serpent says to what God actually said. So go back to the previous chapter. And chapter, chapter 2, verse 16 says, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden. And then here Satan says, did God say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? He's completely corrupting. He's using sort of similar words, but he's just sticking the word not in there. Okay. So he's asking, now, he's not saying that. He's asking a question. You see how sly this is. Temptation, I've got to tell you guys, it's very unusual to think. I, I, I've never, I don't know, maybe I, if I think about it, maybe it's happened, but like, it seems really weird to think that the devil would sort of appear to you like in a vision and he's got red horns and he's just like got a weird tail and he's holding a pitchfork and he's wearing a Halloween costume and he says, 
I would like you to commit a sin and offend to God so that you can go to hell. Who the hell would say yes to that? Just Johnny with you on the back. No, nobody would say yes to that. The devil doesn't tempt us by saying, please commit this sin. It doesn't even start with, do this. It starts with a very sly little question that implies something but doesn't actually say it. Remember, the, the serpent is, the word is subtle. He's slick. Okay? He's like a salesman. Like a, like a good salesman. Not like those moms that are like, they, they, they'll message you on Facebook, like, I have a really exciting opportunity. And you're like, oh, gosh. You know what I'm talking about? Pyramid schemes? I'm sorry if that's what you do for a living. Okay. So, <clears throat> so the devil is really subtle like this. Did God say, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Now, what's happening? One, he's corrupting what God said. And second, what is he drawing attention to? He is painting a picture of God as the guy who says you're not allowed to do things. Okay? You, let me say that again. He is painting a picture of God. He's, he's like making a portrait of God as if what God is, is the guy that says you're not allowed to do stuff. He's the naysayer. And what does it mean to have a relationship with God? It just means you're just not allowed to do things. That's Satan's picture of God. So now, be a little bit alarmed if that's your picture of God. It means you've sort of bought into a lie. That is not who God is. Who God really is, according to the actual text, according to the narrator, God is the one who says, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden. But there's just this one exception. Satan is drawing attention to the one exception to make you feel like God is there to, as, as out to get you and to stop you from having fun. So far so good? Okay. Um, and the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. So she's representing so far correctly uh, what God actually said. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now we have to be really careful. Word by word, I want to sort of see what's the difference between what God said and what Eve said. God said, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. God names it the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eve says, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden. You guys see the difference? Now, I pointed this out last week. Which was the tree that was said to be in the middle of the garden? The tree of life. So Eve actually has it wrong. Or if not wrong, it's at least imprecise. And the way I think we can picture this, I think this is actually probably right. It seems like both trees are great. Now I have to draw a tree. Is this a tree? Tree? No. It's either a tree or like a nuclear bomb. Yeah. <laughs> It seems like both trees were in the middle of the garden. So there's a sort of a section of the garden that we're calling the middle. Remember the temple stuff I was saying last week? So we're going to call this the middle. And then there's, you know, according to some traditions, there's sort of three areas in the garden. One is called Eden. And then, how did it go? Paradise. And then the middle. I don't know, whatever. But there's, it looks like both. So... That's one difference, is Eve said, don't eat from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, even though there were two, it looks like. That's one difference, instead of naming it the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What's another difference? Let me read it again. Eve says, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Did God say you can't touch it? No. So God says, you shall, you shall not eat of that tree of knowledge. He never says not to touch it. So that's two differences. Eve calls it the tree in the middle. She says, we're not allowed to touch it. And there's a very subtle difference that I'm going to actually, I'm going to, I'm going to hold off on that for a second. Where did, she come, where did she come up with, you shall not touch it? Where did she come up with the tree in the middle instead of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Why, why is that, why is she inaccurate in this description? Do you think it was intentional? 
just naive? She didn't know. I don't know. Yeah, maybe she didn't know. But why? How? How would she not know? You're kind of on the right track. But how is it possible for Eve to not know God's okay. command? What is it? He was tricked by the devil. How? Right. How? He actually got to her. He made her think the wrong way. He, maybe. The temptation made her think. Maybe, but I think there's actually an easier explanation. Than oh, that. she's um, making it. it um, She's just giving an excuse that, yes, maybe I could do this. She's allowing it to herself. No, nope, no. Nope. There's actually a much plainer one. Nope. Adam didn't tell her? Yeah. You guys notice something? Eve wasn't there when God gave this command. She wasn't created yet. So she's hearing the command secondhand from Adam. So Adam told Eve, so Adam hears from God, don't eat of the knowledge of, tree of knowledge of good or evil, uh, lest you die. No, for on the day you will you eat of it, you will die. Adam tells Eve, because he she wasn't there when it, when the command was given, he tells Eve, okay, look, don't eat that from that tree. In fact, don't even touch that tree. God said not even to touch that tree. So it's it's as if Adam, that's that's one I think plausible explanation of this. It's as if Adam is sort of adding a layer of padding. He's just really kind of overprotective, and so he's kind of overdoing it. Like, okay, don't even touch it. And you know what? Don't even, like... Don't even go in the middle. Neither, neither of those trees in the middle. Just, like, just stay away from that middle part. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's something... Does that make sense? It sounds like a... We do. It sounds like a parent almost. Yeah, yeah. But Adam wasn't her dad. And I think that's sort of suggestive of a problem that might have been there already. Okay. That he wasn't totally open with her. He didn't give her the, the command directly. Okay. Now, there is one other difference that's really interesting. And this is very subtle, and it's... A little bit clearer in the Hebrew, apparently, than it is in English, but it, it is, there's a difference in English. Look at what she says. She says, you shall not eat of the fruit, blah, 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 lest you die. So I'm just going to write this word, lest, which is kind of a funny word. Lest you die. But God says, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for on the day of the, you eat of it, you shall die. I'm going to say for here. This is what God says, for. Now, in Hebrew, these are actually sort of, there's a clear distinction between these words. And what Eve is doing when she's uh, uh, conflating this, this is a consequence. This implies a reason. Now, I want to pause and talk about this because this is actually kind of a very interesting distinction here. Don't cheat on your wife. For when she finds out, she will leave you because you deserve that. Is your wife leaving you the reason why you shouldn't cheat on her? No. Is it a consequence? Yeah, it's a consequence. Is that the reason why you shouldn't cheat? Not unless you're a loser. You know what I mean? So Eve is conflating. It's not that we shouldn't eat of this tree because there will be some punishment afterwards. We shouldn't eat of the tree. We shouldn't like disobey God because we shouldn't disobey God. There shouldn't be any further reasoning than that. God loves us and he's telling us not to do something, so we should just do it for that reason. So this, so, but Eve in her mind is conflating. She's switching the consequence of that action with the reason why she shouldn't do it. Are you guys seeing that? Kind of a subtle thing, but it, but it's important, right? Like, if you guys were in a relationship and your significant other said, you know, I would never cheat on you because I, I don't want you to get mad at me. Uh, is that, like, flattering? Like, oh, you're so sweet. Right? That's, 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 that, but that's exactly what he was expressing the commandment. I don't want to disobey God. I don't want to betray this trust that God has put in me because there's this punishment that comes afterward that already and you guys, are you guys seeing this is the second piece of evidence that even before they ate the fruit there was already trouble in fact there's something that, that we skipped over when, a, when a, a snake starts talking to you and asking you questions what's the proper response uh, get the hell out of there no stop running actually. yeah please do not have a conversation she or that was already a mistake even answering his question are you guys seeing that now again let's take this back to the level of this is what happens to all of us when we're tempted what's the proper response to temptation if in your mind you hear you know, you're sort of thinking like oh 
you know, is it really that bad, whatever it is? Don't have that conversation, guys. That's the, the first mistake is even starting to have that conversation. The right response is, shut up, please. Like, I don't know, maybe, maybe you can say it even more violently than that. You know, you don't have to run, it'll be weird, but like. Was there a reason that that specific phrase was um, on God's commandment? Like, yes, that? yeah, but I'll get to that later. Or maybe not at all, I don't know. <laughs> but yes, that, that's an awesome question. In fact, you're asking a, a very important question. I, I want to just sort of, let me, let me elaborate your question without answering it, okay? Just to make it more frustrating for you. <laughs> um, you're kind of asking, does God command things arbitrarily? Or does he command things because there's a reason why certain things shouldn't be done? Now, let me give you an answer for that, because I think there's, a, there's actually a very right answer, and it's the second one. God commands things because they're bad. He doesn't just randomly choose things and say, you don't do this, and because I said so. God never, ever, ever does things because he said so. God says so because it's bad for us. Now, what that implies, okay, I guess I have to answer a question now. I'm like already like three feet into it. So why did God say so? Because this is the knowledge of good and bad, and it's better for us just to like live with trust and openness and what was the word I was using last week? Instinct. With just sort of, but on the day that we do of it, on the on the day that we do sort of eat of this knowledge of good and bad, we're going to talk about what that what that might mean in a second. The day that we taste that, our life's going to get really complicated, and it's going to lead very directly to mortality, which we're going to talk about when we get to this fig leaf stuff. This realization that they're naked. Okay, So there are... Now, what that really means is we shouldn't eat, eat of it because God commanded it, but God commanded it because of these bad consequences. So what that really means is there is a correlation here. There is something similar about the reason why we shouldn't do it and this consequence. Okay, uh, But a sort of innocent attitude would be, okay, mom and dad said not to do this, and they love me, so I'm just not going to do it. You guys, you see that? I don't know if I made your question even more messy, but here we are. Okay. Okay. Um, I think the same thing for some kids. They don't listen to mom and dad. <laughs> I've never heard of a kid that doesn't listen to mom and dad. Let out of Mindy. Need to get it. Every kid on the face of the earth doesn't listen to mom and dad. Ana kamaya <laughs> Yeah. So what you're saying kind of seems to be alluding to the fact that there wasn't a, a black and white switch. Like, right. they weren't just aware of Correct. sin after. Correct. So it was a progression. In fact, the only thing that they were aware of that was new after the sin, that, that, were, that were naming a sin, was their nakedness. Everything else, they, so that verifies what I said like two weeks ago. This is the knowledge of good and bad. Not good and evil. They already had knowledge of good and evil. They already had a moral conscience, a sort of, or at least the sort of bare potentiality of moral conscience. Okay. Now let's see. So even in a sort of more innocent state, we make these dumb mistakes. We start to have this conversation. Then what happens? But the serpent said to the woman, "You will not die." Now that's an outright lie. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and bad. Okay, outright lie, and he's implying not just that God uh, is the guy that doesn't want us to have fun, but he's jealous of us in some way. Or he does, he's like sort of protective of something that only he gets to have. You see what I mean? So now the devil is painting, sorry, the, the serpent here, I want to be precise. The serpent is painting a picture of God not just as the, the, the guy that's ruining your fun, but he's ruining your fun because he's jealous of you or something like that. There's some weird picture that he has of God. Okay. However, go to verse 7. It says, Then the eyes of both were opened. And Satan's, and the, the serpent says, Your eyes will be opened. So he's not entirely lying. Okay. Now what's the warning here. The warning here is uh, 
don't just be cautious when it comes to lies. Lies are not really the worst problem. The most harmful thing is not a lie. The most harmful thing is a half-truth. I think it's a very wise... People have told me that before. And I was like, well, no, how, how can a half-truth be worse than a lie? No, a half-truth can actually be a lot more harmful than a lie because it's more believable. A flat-out lie, most people just kind of instinctually just say, like, ah, that's, that's wrong. But when there's a half-truth, that truth part kind of clicks, and then the part that's not true slips under the radar. It's, it's and, open for debate. Uh, you know, for you to sin. You could debate sure. within yourself. So, yeah, so within yourself, you're like, oh, well, that part is true, and you're sort of ignoring the question whether the other part is true. You see that? So be very, very careful of half-truths. Be very sort of wary of them. Yeah. Can you give, like, an example? Yeah, sure. Um, let's see. No, no, I, I think of, I thought of one actually. This is very slightly political. It's more economic than political, so don't take it with a grain of salt. I'm not, I'm not making any political statement here. But there's a verse in the Bible in uh, Paul's letters that say that says, where Saint Paul says, "He who does not work should not eat." Okay, that's a line from Saint Paul. Okay, is that true? Yeah, it's true. Now, can it be a half truth? It can be a half truth if you put it into a certain context. If you put into a certain economic... Because St. Paul's context in saying that is within the Christian community, laziness is a bad thing. He doesn't mean that to become the economic policy of a country. He's not talking about that at all. I'm not saying it should or shouldn't be. It's just completely out of context. So it's a truth, but a truth in the wrong context is, is kind of like a half lie. That's kind of an example of that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Or uh, let, me, let me give you the other side of the, of the economic problem. Okay. You can also quote Acts of the Apostles, where it says, the believers were all living together and they shared all things in common. Okay? So now somebody can use that to justify communism, because the first apostles, the early church, were basically living in a communism. But again, what's the context? The context is this very, very tiny group of people that already believed willingly gave their stuff to the community. But people can justify these very extreme economic policies, just like people can justify this other quote from St. Paul. See what I mean? So those, th those are both examples of things that are true within one context, but don't necessarily apply in others. So those are examples of half-truths. I can probably think, I, I might think of more before the end, and I'll, I'll just like uh, spit them out. Okay. Um, here's where the temptation gets really uh, kind of existential. Look at this, look at verse, Six, which I extrapolated here. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. That's what she saw. Here's the sort of million dollar question. What she saw was, it was good for food, it was a delight to the eyes, and it was desired to make one wise. That's what she saw. Here's the $10 question. Did it just go from like a million dollar question to a $10 question? <laughs> Stock market was really bad today, is that what happened? Uh, what did she not see? The question is not what she saw, the question is what she didn't see. Is it the bad? Hmm? The bad? Yeah. yeah no, she didn't see God's command anymore. In fact, there's a lot she didn't see. You know what else she didn't see? The other, like, 10,000 trees that were in that garden that she could have eaten from. This is the way temptation works. Look inside yourself and, and sort of remember a time that you were tempted. And just, and just like, realize, and I'm sure everyone's going to relate to this, what temptation does is it constricts your vision. And suddenly, only the thing that you're looking at exists. Nothing else exists and nothing else matters. Not God's command, not the people in your life, not the people that you care about that are going to get hurt when you, when you do this. None of that is even in your vision. It's like those, you know those blinders they put on horses? You ever see horses like, they put these things on their eyes. I, I suppose it's to make them walk straight, right? So that they don't go all over the place. So in this case, it's like it's, the devil's putting blinders on you. Temptation is, is causing you to have a kind of 
tunnel vision so that only the thing that you're desiring is within there. Okay. Now, what does that imply? It implies that one of the ways out of temptation is to do the opposite, which is to sort of, let me back up here, hold on, hold on, let me back up, let me see a larger content, let me put other things into this. And I've done this sort of experiment with people before and with myself, where, okay, somebody's talking to you and like, oh, it's, it's sad to say this, but I've, I've, I've had to talk people out of suicide many times in my priesthood, many times. And when somebody has their mind set on it, it, it becomes this thing that they want, which is a really dark place to be, you know? And they really want it. And so when you introduce to them, what about your niece? You've got a four-year-old niece. What's, what's going to happen to her? She's going she, she's to remember you. Don't think she's not going to remember you. And when she's going to get older, and at some point they're going to tell her what, what, you, what you did. Now, it's very eye-opening when you're in that dark place and you're considering suicide. But people get mad. It's good. You need to, I mean, that might be a way to kind of break through to them. But I've done that before. And I said, think about this and think about this and think about this. And they get angry at me because they don't want, it's not that, here's why it's our fault. Here's why it, falling into temptation is our fault. It's not that we don't see because we're just like, our eyesight isn't good that, at that moment. We don't see because we don't want to see. The desire is the thing that causes the blindness when a temptation's operating. It's not that the blindness causes the desire. It's not that because she only saw the fruit, then she wanted it. It's the opposite. The fact that it was all of these things made her not see anything else and because she didn't want to see anything else. And that's the way temptation works for all of us. I can guarantee that. But that's the sort of psychological sort of format of all temptations. Okay. Um... Are you guys, I mean, does that synchronize with, with your experience? I, I suppose it probably does, but if somebody else's experience of temptation is like, no, it's not like that at all, then, I don't know. Tell me about it, I guess. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Here's the, here's the funny part. There is a funny part. So when she saw all this, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, and he he ate. Okay, this is really really interesting. Uh, uh, no, gosh, I don't remember Hebrew. Memory. There we go. Okay, it's the letter M. I, don't know. I keep forgetting how to write this one. Okay. This word is, is, is in the text, but for some reason it's not in all the translations, and I don't know why. Uh, but this is really important. In fact, this is the whole punchline is, is in this word. Then I'm going to give you the translation of it in a second. It's really dumb to think that the story of the temptation and the fall is telling us that it's Eve's fault. That is an absolute stupid misreading of this text. Now, Eve is the one that was, was talking to the serpent, and she's the one that ate the fruit first. And she's the one that gave it to her husband. And in fact, Adam says that later. We're not even going to get there today. But Adam says, uh, the woman gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. So Adam does blame Eve. But that doesn't mean it's her fault. That just means Adam's blaming her. And it's all because of this... That, that whole interpretation is wrong because of this word. This means... Okay, never mind. I'm not going to tell you. Johnny has a question. Yeah. Not a question. That's a half truth. Yeah, it's a half truth. That's good. Yeah. Thanks. What's half truth? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this word means this. Her husband, who was with her. I don't know how you could not translate this. More sorry, I don't want to yell at translators. How do you how do you miss this word? Her husband, she gave some to her husband who was with her. That means he was listening. the entire time <laughs> that Eve was talking to a friggin' snake. He was watching. Adam was standing there like a jackass, doing nothing. 
So Eve's sin consisted in having this stupid conversation with the stupid snake. Adam's sin was in not doing anything at all. It was his job to, I don't know, grab the snake and throw it outside the garden. Like grab it by this tail and just, I don't know. That was his job, or at least tell Eve, uh, can you not do this right now? Can we talk about, can we talk about this? <laughs> he did nothing. He didn't say a word. And that was Adam's sin, not eating the fruit. The sin was a sin of omission. It was neglecting what he should have done. That was the original sin of Adam. Because the fruit is an irrelevant thing. It's, it's, it's arbitrary. As if th th this type, this particular fruit, there's something bad about it. No, there's nothing bad about some physical thing. It's not just the act of disobedience here. It's that he did nothing to prevent it. This irresponsibility is Adam's, the, the heart of the sin from the side of Adam. Yeah, Andrew. So, um, so then when we were born with original sin and that's what we're baptized to cleanse, what, was this, what, are, what is the sin that we're born with? Uh, I don't know. What, what it means that we're... The, 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 the Catholic teaching that we're born with concupiscence, or the, this, you know, what we call this original, we're born with original sin and we're baptized to cleanse it, what it means really, the sort of concrete application of it, is that we're born screwed up. Like we're born with, with, with like messed up desires and a, and a bad conscience. And, you know, and we learn from parents and, and a society and cousins and friends who are also screwed up. And so it just means that when we open our eyes, we're not quite right and we need correction. And baptism is, it doesn't completely magically fix all that. It, it, it sacramentally... Uh, uh, makes us into the body of the church and makes us members of Christ so that we can be healed of this throughout the life of grace that we live on this earth. You know what I mean? Um, so I don't want to say much more than that because it gets into kind of like muddy waters, but that's the basic answer. Yeah. Um, now, what, now I, I get your question though, and I want to kind of get to the sort of underlying question behind your question, which is, okay, what of this applies right now? And I think all of it applies right now. And I don't think... I don't think it's at all true to say men and only men are guilty of sins of omission where they don't do what they're responsible to do. And women and only women are guilty of sins of having conversations with snakes. With money. I don't think that's the story that it's telling us. I think it's telling us, like, look, within human relationships, this is a typical thing that happens. Okay? Usually men are tricked, sorry, usually women are tricked with words. Right? And men are tricked with women. <laughs> and that seems to be a kind of typical experience that most of us can, kind of, can, can kind of get. Like we all sort of recognize that. You know, How, you know if, if you meet these like sleazeballs at, at clubs that like try to seduce women, they use words. That's one of the things they, you know, they, they'll seduce them using, they'll say this, they'll compliment them. With it. So the conversations are the way to sort of tempt a woman. And the way you tempt a man is you just have a woman just like, tells you to do something, and then maybe they do it, because they're dumb, okay? It's, it's, like I said, it's kind of a typical, stereotypical experience of human beings. I don't think it's at all, I think all of us are guilty of uh, giving into temptation the way Eve gave into it, and all of us are guilty of sins of omission the way Adam is guilty, so. Um. Okay, Adam was standing there. Can you talk about a little bit about the consequences? I know that, let's, yeah. say, let's say they ate the apple. Yeah. What, what happened exactly? Did they yeah. actually turn from dust to dust? Is that yeah. So, is no, it? not exactly. In fact, I, uh, actually, I'm gonna, that's all I'm going to talk about well, next week. The well, whole, yeah. all of next week is just going to be on the consequences. Well, which one was, is important? About, all of them. Of the consequences? All of them. Because they say that life... Because, Steve, all the rest of the chapter okay. is about the consequences. So I'm going to give a detailed response to that. Because okay. it's a good question. Um, just wanted to know which yeah. one was important. And yeah. then you said it's yeah, yeah. Okay. I want I want to work through that in detail next week. And then the fruit was. You said ah, we're not there yet. We're close. <laughs> we're so close, Steve. Is it a pomegranate? But I only have two minutes left. <laughs> Maybe uh, I'll stall it again just to be a no, jerk. Oh, this, this is job. Uh, no, because I like the last fifteen minutes. To this have is teasing us again. So we can I'm telling you, man. <laughs> this is what makes me wake up in the morning. Nice. It's, it's being mean. Um, <laughs> As long as you're an equal offender, we're okay with that. Yes. yes. Um, then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. 
I think I do have to leave the, the fruit till next week because I want to talk about nakedness for a second, even though that's awkward. Let's talk about nakedness. What does it mean that they realized that they were naked? They knew from right or wrong. What is it? They knew from right or wrong at that point. Okay, well, shame, I think, is the right way to think about it. They were ashamed of being naked. Whereas before, it says, there's a verse that says, uh, verse chapter 2, verse 25, they were naked, but they weren't ashamed. So it's not that there's something... And this is something that... I kind of want to stand behind this podium right now. Uh, <laughs> there's something that I think is worth saying about modesty. You know, we talk about modesty a lot, and it's a, it's a nice virtue. It's an important thing to think about. And the idea of modesty is not that there's something bad about the human body, or that there's something shameful about, about your skin. There's something evil about your skin. That's not what the idea at all. The idea is modesty is a virtue... Because we live in a fallen world, Adam and Eve were naked, but they didn't even realize it because they were innocent. Modesty is not a virtue in a kind of abstract, sort of immaterial way. Modesty is, I'm sorry, let me explain. Modesty is the virtue of, among other things, treating your body with respect and not being sort of too, like, being, having clothing and having, like, actions that are not sort of overtly sort of sexualized. And it also means kind of covering up your body in, in a proper way. But that wouldn't be a virtue at all if human beings were innocent. That's what Genesis is saying. It's only a virtue you only need to hide because other people are looking. And modesty is a virtue because everybody else is a slime ball. And so it's not because there's something bad about you that you need to cover up. It's because there's a, something bad about everybody else. That out of respect to yourself... You say, I don't deserve to be looked at like that. So screw you, and I'm going to cover up and get out of here. Do you guys see that? Mm -hmm. Because modesty can be kind of painted, especially to women, I think, are victimized. They're sort of made the victims of the virtue of modesty when it's explained sometimes. It's total misunderstanding. You're, you don't have to cover up because there's something wrong with you. you. Women have to cover up because there's something wrong with men. But, sorry, there is something wrong with men. So you do have to cover up. Sorry. It sucks. But that's the best I can do. I can't, if I could go and transform every single guy on the face of the earth, I'd start with myself too. I would do that, but I can't. And so instead of that, protect yourself from that kind of look because you deserve better. You guys see, kind of seeing that? Um, now, let me, let me say a little bit more about this nakedness thing. Nakedness doesn't only have a kind of sexual implication. It also implies sort of two other things. It implies vulnerability. Okay, so if you think of what clothing is about, clothing is one about the sort of sexual, okay, don't look at me, that's creepy. It's also, though, about, right now it's sort of raining outside, so we get something that's waterproof to protect ourselves from the elements. So nakedness also implies weakness. And then third, more related to the sexual part, nakedness implies what the sexual organs imply. And what do the sexual organs imply? Reproduction. Now, what does that have to do with anything, much less mortality? Because what does it mean that we reproduce? We make other beings like ourselves, right? Little kids. But what does it mean that we make other beings like ourselves? It means we're replacing ourselves for when we're not here anymore. And so the very idea of, of sexual reproduction, that the organ, the sexual organs, that this shame, that this noticing of them for the first time implies, really implies mortality itself. What does it mean that we have kids? Something built into that very concept implies that we're going to die one day. And we have kids because we're going to die one day, and that's going to be a part of us that lives on. Okay. And all of that's contained in they realized they were naked, and so they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So this sort of very first phase of technology, if you can call it technology, is to make up for this vulnerability that we have as human beings um, out of this sort of basic weakness. Okay. Very simple technology. Sewed fig leaves together. Okay. Um, so that's where I'm going to start next week. I'm going to start with that leaf thing. Uh... And then we'll talk about that. Actually, it makes sense because that's actually tied to the consequences that we're going to talk about for, for most of next week.
Were there separate consequences for yeah. Ian and Adam yeah. as well? Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's why I want to go into detail because there's a lot going on there. Good. Okay, any questions about that or other topics? Yes, ma'am. No, she wasn't. Was it? So God said to Adam, don't eat of this tree. Then afterwards, a few verses later, he, he created Adam out of the rib. So was that, sorry, he created Eve out of it. It's Adam and Adam now. Uh, um, <laughs> we're in California, man. Uh, so, yeah, so the, the creation of Eve happened after that command was given. So my, my interpretation, I think it's, it's one legitimate interpretation, is that Adam told her about the command and commandment, but Muzid he, he sort of added to it. Yeah. He's what? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's the problem. Yeah, that's the problem. Speaking of which, Johnny. <laughs> that you're a problem. Did Adam and Eve know? Yeah, question. I'm going to get you next. You're next, yeah, Johnny. Say that one of the reasons that God allows uh, the devil to tempt Adam and Eve is to show that uh, they love him, because at that point uh, we haven't read anything about their love for God. Actually, by that point, we don't even have any indication that they're aware of God at all. In fact, the next verse is the first indication we have that they're aware of God at all. After they realize they're naked, it says they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. God spoke to Adam. God spoke to Adam all the time. Adam never noticed that. Adam never noticed that. Well, I mean, I'm not saying he did. I'm not saying it says that he didn't notice. But the first time Adam speaks to God is after the fall. Well, so you're saying that Adam just listened to God. Yeah. But again, like, it's it's not this sort of conversational thing. It's just this, there's this commandment, and Adam's like, okay. They don't have to give them a relationship. No. Not at all. So that's really interesting, actually. It's one of the things we'll talk about next week. There is no relationship, really, between Adam and human beings and God until after the fall. Isn't that interesting? So it's not about this innocence that we have to kind of return to. It's that now that we're fallen, what do we do? Now that we know how screwed up we are, well, we can't go back. What's the what are we supposed to do with this? And in fact, the whole rest of the Bible is, is telling us that story. About what do we do about it now that... We, now that we've fallen. Okay, so yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, Steve, you're next. Um, the, the next question is, did Adam and Eve know that they were committing a, a wrong when they ate the fruit? Because at that time, they haven't eaten the fruit of wisdom that tells them what's good and bad. I repeat, it's good and bad, not good and evil. They already knew what was right and wrong Well, before that. They never had an intent to do it. Since they they did. Know. Nope, they intended it. What, the disobedience yep. of God? Yep, they yes. intended to disobey. Okay. Yep. And because they had the capacity to disobey before the fruit. In the, in the criminal justice system, we look at intent, opportunity, and ability. Yep. Did they have the intent to yep. do it? And you're saying they did? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I know that's something that comes up once in a while in, in these weeks of Bible study that, we've, that I've addressed. Right. How could they sin if they didn't know right and wrong? Yes. But it's the tree of good and bad that's okay. different than right and wrong. Okay. So now, here's, here's what the real... Now, I'm getting a little bit into the consequences of next week. But here's the real point. Now, they know good and bad. Because now Eve is going to feel pain in childbirth. That's bad. That sucks. Now Adam is going to have to work with the sweat of his hands. It's not that they now know what a sin is. They knew that before. At least implicitly or in a kind of potential way. Now they know the bad consequences. That's what the tree was knowledge of. And what did they, when did, I mean, what did it mean when he said, I'm going to open your eyes? Yeah, he opened their eyes and now you know what suffering is. Okay, so yeah. this, it was to the suffering, yeah. not to the it's, it's bad, not evil, that they learned. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. yeah, you're next. What's your name? Uh, me? Yeah. George. George. What's up? Uh, so my question was about the temptation. You went kind of the tunnel vision that we yeah. have in temptation. Yeah. Could something good that we desire be bad? Like, uh, I'm not talking about food or anything sure. like that. I'm talking about, like, being a part of the church. Could the desire for that, like... Monastery, like being in a monastery or 
question or like yeah so sure sure getting sure. your degree that sure um, so good question let me answer it in a more gen generic way and I'll give it and then I'll answer it in a more specific way to the, the things you brought up mm -hmm. yes gen generally speaking in fact I can say this basically universally every temptation is about something that itself is kind of good is, is by itself good okay so if you ask like I don't know, a typical thing people are tempted to do, like sex, sexual sins. But is, is sex a bad thing? No, sex is not a bad thing. It's just when it's in the wrong context, then there's bad consequences to it, man. Like, so there, that's, a, that's an example of a, bad, of a good thing that because the, the situation is not right, can be very, very harmful and damaging. Now, hold on, let me finish the question. Let me finish. Am I interrupting you? A career. Sorry. <laughs> just went I know, let me just let me finish my sentence. Just give me a hug. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I was looking through my old, you know, Google is creepy and keeps all your pictures that you've ever taken. You know, you remember, you know that Google Photos? It uploads every photo. I, and I was like, look, I don't know. I was bored at lunch because the priests were talking. And I wasn't paying attention. And I was like scrolling, <laughs> and I found a picture of like me and you, like on a retreat, like twelve years ago or something like that. And then Wes, I have all these pictures of all, like a lot of you guys. It's weird. Google's like stalking us. I know I deleted all the pictures of Johnny. Yeah. <laughs> um, so even church stuff, absolutely, because somebody can seek to be a member of a monastery or part of the church or want to be a shamasha or want to be a deacon or want to be a priest or something like that out of pride and want to be looked, somebody to be looked up to and want to look like, feel like they're smart and important. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I can't off the top of my head think of anything that the devil can't use in, in a kind of corrupt way um, to, to sort of uh, to, to turn us against uh, God and, and his truth and his goodness. Yeah, good question. I like that. Yeah. And so career is another one. Yeah, or even a, a degree or a diploma. I want to get my degree so that I can make people think that I'm smarter than them or whatever. Well, even making your country better. And, you know, you're oh, yeah. thinking of you know, prospering your country, but then you don't think of other Absolutely. countries. Yeah. Absolutely. So you just think for yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Yeah. How do you avoid the ration? Like you said, don't have that talk with the serpent. Like yeah. Don't. How do you avoid that? It's. Oh. It's. Uh, <laughs> like it, you have to ask those questions, or you, you know, because you have to come to know right. what's good and what's right. Well, yeah. So I, I okay. Yeah, let me clarify that. I don't mean don't have moral uh, uh, analysis. What I mean is don't toy with temptations. On the contrary, you should be very thorough. You should, to the best of your intellectual ability, you should understand why right things are right and why wrong things are wrong. That's one of the reasons to come to this Bible study. You know, so that's it's a different thing to have a kind of intellectual understanding or analysis of what's why is morality what it is and what's right and wrong and so on and so on. What I what what the conversation with the serpent is? It's not that. It's uh, uh, I'm going to sort of toy with the idea, like oh you know oh let me imagine. Imagine what it's like to eat three, three by threes. It's a very unpleasant experience. The first one and a half was great. Why did I do that? I'm still feeling it. It's like right here. What is it? Confession. <laughs> I should mention it next time I go to confession. Yeah. Gluttony and pride. The sad thing is I'm still proud that I did it. <laughs> wrong with me? Yeah. What are the questions you guys have? Yes, sir. You said that the consequence for Eve was that she would bear a painful... Um, Next week we're going to talk all about that, yeah. Was it also ruled by husband? Yep. So women are created to be ruled by husband? No, they're not created because of sin. Yeah, that's a consequence of sin. It's not by creation. Yep, that's one of the things we'll talk about next week. Yeah. 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 So could you say that the reason that um, you didn't want to speak and decree of good and evil would, and the, the consequence from that was suffering, was, was he trying to protect us from suffering? Yep, yep. In fact, that's the model for all of God's commands. Really, it's really important to understand. And Jesus, here's the way Jesus says this. He says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Okay. 
So the commands of God are there for us because it's what's best for us. It's not that God created us so we could follow a bunch of rules. Okay. So if that's the pattern, really sort of step back and, and re-evaluate <coughs> your relationship to the church and to your, to your faith. Because as we're growing up, our parents, because we're little kids and the simplest thing to tell a little kid is don't do this, without going to these deep explanations of why and what's going to happen, like just stop, these are the rules, we grow up thinking that faith is nothing but a bunch of rules. But on the contrary, and, and rules about stuff that we want to do, even worse. And that's a totally bad understanding of what's going on. On the contrary, like, I may have said this in here before, I was talking to somebody a couple weeks ago, and they were just, you know, gosh, I, you know, it's one of these, I used to be Catholic people. You ever meet one of those? I used to be Catholic people. Oh, I used to be Catholic. But then, like, you know, all these rules. And then especially, like, the sex stuff, you know. And I said, like, yeah, Catholics are, like, the, the Catholic Church is weird about sex. I'll, I'll be the first one to say that. All kinds of sex things are sins. Right? I hope you guys know that. <laughs> yeah. So, but besides that, all kind, it's all kinds of stuff. And then they were just like, but, and then they were, they were, and they said, but look, let's be frank here. Yes, the church is weird about sex, but isn't sex weird? Uh, yeah. It's weird. And because it's weird, it has these bad consequences. It can be so addicting so quickly. You can get pregnant when you don't want to get pregnant. You can get your heart broken a billion times. So much worse if that's involved. Yeah, of course God wants to protect us from all that. And that's the reason why all this sex stuff is bad is considered a sin, is because it's harmful. I just thought of that just because of this conversation a few weeks ago, but exactly. And now go back and review. Literally everything that's forbidden is only forbidden because it's bad for us in the end. That's essentially Jesus' teaching. Nothing that God forbids is just because he's he wants to annoy us. Like, I want to annoy you guys by not telling you what kind of fruit it was. That's because I'm a sick human being and I take pleasure out of it. God is much holier than I am, okay? He's not like that. Do you guys you see that? Very important point. I really don't want that to sink in. But um, there are also good things to sex. I don't want to know. You don't want to know? You want me to read it out? No. It's reproduction, that's all. Yeah. No, no, I don't want to. We're not talking about sex. Even the Bible it's already awkward enough. God and be fruitful and multiply. Absolutely. No, no, that's my point, in fact. Yeah. It's because it's a good thing, right. but it's a good thing that's potentially harmful, so be careful, careful with it. Having children is harmful? I thought that was Oh, that's blessing. worse than sex. That's a blessing. <laughs> you have any kids? Not yet. That's why you're saying that. Yeah, but <laughs> I have nephews. And, uh, yeah, you have nephews. Yeah. Having yeah. nephews yeah. and nieces yeah. is fun. <laughs> Having kids is a whole different story. Yeah, but... Uh, I've never had to change your diaper. Them. It doesn't depend on the way you raise them and the way you give it to them. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> nice. I have no idea. I haven't raised kids. Just you, just you guys. Oh, well, we are your children. Yeah. Uh, but I haven't. But I'm not raising you. Nice. You're, you're all still infants. Well, okay. Training us in the right direction. I hope. I hope. Okay. Any last questions?